We spend a lot of time reflecting on the darkness of Good Friday and Jesus' death on the cross. Yet the hope Jesus gives does not end with the cross. The cross is just the beginning. Through his resurrection, Christ initiated the rebirth of all creation. In the days following the resurrection of Jesus, everything changed for his followers. Their hearts were stirred with new hope. It was as if the new life of Jesus had also given new life to them. God had fulfilled his promise to his people. Though they had been long in the desert, they now experienced the abundant life of their risen King. We too have the hope of resurrection. Christ has not left us to ourselves, but has given us the Holy Spirit to guide and direct us, to sustain us until Christ's coming. From death, from decay, from the desert, we have been called to life. Hey, this morning we're going to be in a chapter, in chapter 7 in John. And we're talking about the Holy Spirit, of course, and the promise of the Spirit. But when you open your Bibles, if you're a paper Bible guy like I am, you notice that somewhere down through the years, somebody put these subheadings and these headings on these scriptures. And if you go to chapter 7 in the Gospel of John, one of the headings that you see is it says, The Festival of Tabernacles. Uh, it could say the Feast of Booths or the Festival of Booths. It could say the Feast of Shelters. Mine says the Feast of Shelters in my Bible. It could say the Festival of Shelters. It may even say this Jewish word called Sukkot, S-U-K-K-O-T. And this chapter 7 uh, is that subheading because what John is doing kind of in 7 and kind of as he moves into even chapter 8 is he's wanting us to realize, even though he didn't put that there, somebody later put that there, He's wanting us to realize that what Jesus is saying is coming through in a particular context for the Jewish people. And this particular context for Jesus is this festival of shelters. And I'm going to probably use different words for it as I go along, but you'll know what I mean, right? So there's this, there's this festival called the Festival of Shelters or Booths of Tabernacles. And it was really one of, the, one of four main festivals by the Jewish people. In fact, this festival particularly was used to remind them of a time in the wilderness where God was taking them and redeeming them from Egypt and moving them to a new promised land, the Canaan land, the promised land. I have a pastor friend who talks about this period of wilderness, and he says that it's the honeymoon of the people of Israel. It's a time where God's presence was so close with them that all that existed in the desert was themselves and God himself, God's presence. And what's interesting on Pentecost, the, what's interesting for us today is that in the desert, God's presence was a pillar of fire or a cloud. And so it's amazing that this is what we see in Luke's imagery as we go in there. Well, this festival, it does a couple things. It reminds them of their journey in the wilderness, and it, but, but there's some components to this festival. One would easily be that they would sacrifice animals every day of the festival. They had some other components too. But one of the other things they would do is they would live in these shelters, these portable tents. If you're a kid and a teen here, imagine for a week, because the festival lasted a week, imagine for a week moving into your backyard and living in a Coleman tent to celebrate God's journey between Egypt and the Promised Land. This is what the people of Israel would do. They'd build these portable homes. They even do this today. They use wood, and they use tarps, and they use canvas and fabric. And you can find these places on porches and courtyards. In the old days, you'd find them on roofs of houses. And the people of Israel would actually move out of their permanent homes, and they'd move into these portable shelters to remind them of their journey in the wilderness. Now, not only would they do this, not only would they have sacrifices, but they would have one particular component that's important for us today. They had this thing called the water offering. And see, what the water offering does, it, it does a few things for this festival. One, it helps the people remember how God provided water in the desert when they were thirsty. Because water in the desert is life. 
And so it reminds them that God's presence provides water for them to survive. The next thing it would do is, is it would, so the water would serve as kind of a prayer for the upcoming agricultural year. The time of this particular festival is right before the rainy season in the Middle East. And so the Israelites would come with this water offering and they would pray that God would once again send rain to the desert so that their crops and their harvest would be plentiful and that they would experience a life and abundant time in the harvest. So the third thing that this water thing would do is this water would also be kind of a future-looking perspective of when God will once again be present with his people. So what this component, this water offering looked like is that every day for seven days, a priest would walk out of the temple. He'd walk down to the pool. He'd get this big container of water. And then he would walk back into the temple through the water gate. And then he would mix this water with wine and he would pour this offering of water and wine on the altar. And as he did this, he would remember the presence of God's provision of water. And then he would pray for rain in the upcoming season. Now on the seventh day, the seventh day was a spectacular day. Because he would go down and he would get water and he would walk through the water gate. And then seven times... He would pour this mixture of water and wine on the altar. And the priest would walk around the altar singing praises, but praying for God's salvation for the people. I mean, this is a beautiful, beautiful like experience. It was this festival where they're remembering God's sweetest presence of providing water in the desert. It's this festival that, that, that confesses and prays for rain for their crops. And it's this festival that looks forward to the future where God's presence will once, be, once again be so real that they would have no fear of not having any water for their communities. There's a verse that's actually read during this, out of, from, during this festival, comes from Zechariah. And the scripture is just, it says this. It says, it will happen in one day. Now this is a scripture the priest will, re will read during this time. He says, it will happen in one day, a day known to the Lord. Not in the day or the night, but in the evening there will be light. Moreover, on that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem. Half of them will go to the eastern sea, half of them will go to the western sea. And it will happen both in summer and in winter, all season long, living waters. I love this line. I love this next line. I love this next line. The Lord will then be king over all the earth. In that day, the Lord will be seen as one with a single name. That's a glorious, that's a beautiful verse for the imagery of what's happening in this festival. There's another verse they would also read. It's from Isaiah 44. And this verse says this. It says, this is what the Lord, the one who made you, says. The one who formed you in a womb and helps you. Don't be afraid, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the parched ground and cause streams to flow on the dry land. And pay attention to this next line in Isaiah. I will pour my spirit on your offspring and my blessings on your children. And they will sprout up like trees and grass, like poplar trees beside the channels of water. And so you have this fast. I mean, this is just... This is beautiful scripture. This is beautiful imagery. This is memory. And you have all these things happening on the seventh day. The seven times around, the priest is praying and praising God for salvation. And you're thinking, what in the world has, has this to do with everything? Well, this is exactly what was happening that John records when Jesus comes and speaks about a particular promise that he fulfills. This is the imagery and the memories that the people of Israel will be immersed within. Like this is what would be in their mind when they hear these words of Jesus. And this is what Jesus says in chapter 7, verse 37. It says, On the last day, the greatest day of the feast, seven times around the altar, Jesus stood up and he shouted, If anyone is thirsty, let him come to me. Let the one who believes in me drink. Just as the scriptures say, from within him will flow rivers of living water. 
Man, that's exciting. From within him will flow rivers of living water. Seven times around the altar, a week of water offerings. Jesus comes up and he says, this promise is here today. And then you have these parentheses. Now he said this about the spirit whom those believed in him were going to receive. For the spirit had not yet been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. This is Jesus preaching the gospel. You see, the gospel for us isn't a four-part plan. It's not a, a Roman road. The gospel is a story. It's the story of God coming and living with us as Jesus. And it's the story of Jesus getting rejected and being crucified for our sins. It's a story of Jesus who cannot be held down by death. Death has no victory with Jesus. And Jesus raises from the dead and in his resurrected body for 40 days he's teaching his disciples about the kingdom and then as we learned last week after 40 days he ascends to the father and he is glorified enthroned at the right hand of the father and because of his ascension this, the gospel story continues the holy spirit is given to those who believe we have the promise of living waters Today, we see this vision of living waters in Revelation. We are not waiting for Revelation to experience the promise of God's empowering presence. God's empowering presence, the Holy Spirit, is for us today. It's for you today. I love this. God's presence, God's empowering presence. The, the Holy Spirit is God's presence because the Holy Spirit is nothing less than God's personal gift of himself to you. And given the Holy Spirit, God is giving everything of himself, his intimate relationship. It's a relational gift. It's a person. He's a person. Even I get my pronouns mixed up. Holy Spirit is God's personal, intimate presence with us. But it's his empowering presence. Because everywhere you see the power of the Spirit at work in scriptures, whether it's Genesis 1 or all the way through the scriptures, he is animating life. He is bringing life and making life happen. And not just any kind of life. It's a particular kind of life. It's life as it should have been. God's Spirit is an empowering, personal presence of God himself. And it's for us. This life that the Spirit has for us is a life of togetherness. When you read the fruits of the Spirit and you read Romans 12 and you get these pictures and images of what community looks like when you're filled with the Spirit, it's a, it's a community of selflessness, a community of gentleness, of kindness, of justice, of righteousness, of just pure joy and peace. I want a community like that. And it's a community that includes everybody, all nations. And then there's also a particular kind of life for us individually. Not only is it a life about togetherness, it's a life about being Christ-like. Every time you see the Spirit at work in the New Testament, the birthing of the Spirit in the New Testament is none other than Jesus himself. This is why we call the Spirit the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus sometimes. Because the Spirit births in us the person of Jesus. Kids, teens, the Spirit is wanting to birth in you the presence and Christ-likeness like no one else has seen. God's empowering personal presence. I just love this. The Spirit's goal is to create a Jesus-centered community as life as it should have been. I love this. Living waters. Now. Today. You know, there's the other side to the coin. If you flip the coin, if, if, if Jesus provides living waters, then that means our man-made waters don't lead to the same place. If Jesus and the Holy Spirit provide life and living waters and intimacy with God and peace and joy and rest and meaning, that means my man-made wells, my man-made cisterns, my man-made water sources lead only to death and violence, selfishness, restlessness. 
And listen here, we are great builders of man-made wells. We are people and humans and beings who will worship about anything in front of us. I mean, things that are meant for good for us easily become sources of our peace and our joy, and they replace Jesus. Things like our jobs, our relationships, monies, our, our, our toys at home, our possessions, our, our philosophies about how life should be. Listen, I'm a pastor. I can tell you that there is times that my ministry is a man-made well that I go to for identity, meaning, and rest. How do you know if you're doing that, right? How do you know? Well, let me tell you about how I realize it in my life, and maybe it helps. One of the ways that I realize is like in this last few season, right? This last few, this last few months, we've gotten a lot of like bad news, and honestly, for a while there, I was started looking at everything in my life, and I realized that if I was to go today, that I had really invested my life in a lot of things that weren't Jesus. I had really led a pretty busy life doing things and going places. And I realized that those things, when they're taken from me, they leave me restless and exhausted and empty. God's been working on your pastor this, this, this time. God's been doing a work inside of me. He's been showing me these deep, dry, arid deserts in my soul. These places that I've tried to fill with man-made wells, but they've only led me restless and empty and longing for more. And so what I've realized is, is that the only place of peace for me, the only place of peace for me is to repent of those things and to turn towards Jesus and to say, Jesus, I need your Holy Spirit in my life. I need your rest, your purpose, your meaning. I need life in my life. That's what it looks like in, in my life when I build my own man-made wells. And when they're taken away from me, it leads to anger and grief and frustration. And God's saying, listen to the dry places of your soul. I want to bring water there. You know, the Spirit, God's empowering presence, wants to bring us life, wants to bring you life. God's empowering presence himself. You know, my family needs me to be a person who drinks from one well, the Holy Spirit. My neighborhood needs my family to be a one water family that drinks from one water source. After watching the TV and Facebook these last couple of days, my community needs my neighborhood and my church to be a place who are, and a people who are a one water people. Our world need us to be a one water people, the Holy Spirit. And you can't, we can't live without the Holy Spirit. It's only through the Holy Spirit that we confess God as Father and Jesus as Lord. It's only through the Holy Spirit we can confess that. Now listen, I know there's a lot of people like me here, maybe even gathered at home, that are longing for living water. I know it. And my good news for you today is that Jesus has made a way for us to have living water. Life. And so I thought through what would be an appropriate response to this beautiful day of Pentecost celebrating the promise of living water. Well, I thought that we would do some things that might please the Lord. One of the things I thought we would do is that we would confess that God alone is God our Father. So I'm going to ask you to do is I want you to say that after me or say that with me. I want to say, say, say this with me. I want to say it once. God alone is God my Father. Say it at home. If you're, if you're at home, say this with me. Let's say it. God alone is God my Father. That pleases Him. 
The next thing we're going to say is we're going to say, Jesus is my King and Savior. Even if you're at home, say it loud. Let's say it. You ready? Jesus is my King and my Savior. My favorite story about the Holy Spirit is the is story of Mary and Luke. Because Gabriel tells Mary the Holy Spirit is going to come upon her and the Holy Spirit through Mary is going to birth Jesus. It's beautiful. But I love Mary's response and that's our last thing we're going to say together. It's a long one, so let's try to remember it. She says this, she says, I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to the scriptures. Say it with me. I am a servant of the Lord. Let this happen to me according to the scriptures. I pray that God would fill you with his spirit. I pray that we would be a one water people. I pray that God would move and that you would reply foolishly, obediently to how you feel like the spirit's leading you this week. We need each other to live this way. Let me pray for you. Lord, I just pray for, I pray for us, God. God, I ask you to once again rain on us, Lord. Rain on us. God, fill us full of your spirit. God, lead us to keep coming back to you, Lord. We want to be a one water people. God, help us not to quench your spirit. Help us not to neglect you. But God, help us to fan this flame. Lord, we give you this day. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen. Thank you for being here this morning.